right, well, welcome and thank you so much for joining us for our annual luncheon. Uh, this is always a, a fun event for the outgoing president because they know that their responsibilities are this close to being done, but it's always fun just to kind of celebrate the accomplishments that the Pasco Chamber has every year. And, and we couldn't do this without the, the sponsorship of GISA as well too. And so we're happy to have them on board to be our premier sponsor. Um, and at this time, if you don't mind, let's, let's um, stand up and say the Pledge of Allegiance. I'll go ahead and get it started. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Well, thank you. You may have a seat. We have some uh, elected officials that are here today that I'd like to take a moment to introduce. So as I do that, feel free to give them a warm round of applause. First, from uh, the 9th District, we have State Representative Joe Schmick. Joe, if you want to raise your hand. From Franklin County, we have Commissioners Rick Miller. Where's Rick? There's Rick. And Bob Cook was on the list, and I, don't, I didn't see Bob come in, but uh, no, I don't see him standing up anywhere. So moving along, uh, from the Port of Pasco, we have Commissioner Jim Clindworth. I did see somebody sneak in as well, too. Uh, from Franklin County, we have Prosecutor Sean Sant. I thought I saw him walk in. There he is. <laughs> kind of going out of order here, but. And then from uh, um, Franklin PUD, we have Commissioner Stu Nelson. <laughs> and then Commissioner Bill Gordon. I didn't want to say Stu last because uh, you know you save the best for last, is right. <laughs> Just uh, I don't think St Stu should have a record. Actually, he hasn't missed a luncheon in probably over a couple years. So uh, happy that he's able to make uh, all the time to to join us at uh, our general membership luncheons. Also, want to uh, take a moment too, and and since this is our annual meeting and. And acknowledge the past presidents that are here in attendance, the past presidents of the Pasco Chamber of Commerce. Uh, Ed Ray, unfortunately, wasn't able to make it today, but had all intentions to doing that. But uh, we always want to mention at least Ed, because he is like the godfather of the, the Pasco Chamber of Commerce. And, and we'll look forward to seeing him soon. And then I saw that Kevin Williams is here. Kevin, if you want to stand up, let's give him a round of applause. Uh, Spence Jalek. Uh, Julie Killian, I thought was going to be here, and I don't see her. Ryan Brault, there's Ryan. Uh, Daryl Ebert as well too, I know he snuck in. And I know there's a couple more on the list, but I didn't see them come in, unless I'm missing somebody. Oh, Derek wants to be recognized. He's not a past president yet, but Derek is, is trying to get me to recognize him as a past president. He's very anxious today to, to uh, finish his duty. So, um, so uh, um, before I hand it over to uh, um, Derek to take us through the rest of the program, I want to take a moment to just kind of discuss some of the neat things that the Pasco Chamber was able to accomplish this year, and of course it wouldn't have happened without uh, the support and the leadership of our Board of Directors as well, too. And, and so, you know, for those that don't know, Pasco Chamber was established in 1912 and, and has served as, we, we like to call as the front door for tens of thousands of individuals and businesses for over 100 years. And we primarily like to focus on what's important to our area. So obviously free enterprise and business and agriculture and education is the, and we're a major supporter of that, uh, of those industries and areas. And so um, I know on your uh, table there, there's a, a little agenda and on the other side, it's kind of an infographic as well too of some of the things that we've been able to go through. And I, I do have a, um, some of those graphics that are going to be up on the PowerPoint as well too, but we've, we've, we're always striving to enhance 
benefits uh, for our members and quite frankly for those non-members, but those that choose to do business in our area and we're continually looking for strategies to include more of those area businesses to be in the Pasco Chamber of Commerce, but we're happy to have uh, uh, increased our membership by 20 new members this year and, and uh, um, looking for many more for the years to come. We've had a few uh, events as well this year that uh, um, are uh, um, key to keeping the Pasco Chamber going strong as well too. Some of them uh, revolve around economic development and, and one of the big projects that we've been working on the last couple of years in conjunction with the Port of Pasco is our Pasco Economic Visioning Project or also known as Somos Pasco, excuse me, Somos Pasco. And, and that has been a uh, real um, eye-opening uh, uh, exercise in terms of what uh, makes Pasco what it is and how great it is and, and where we can improve in the future as well too. Um, we're still uh, in the process of, of this study and this visioning project, but we're kind of on the tail end of it, so I know we'll have some information to share with uh, not only our membership in the city of Pasco, but for the area as well too as to what comes up with that uh, visioning effort and what, and what we need to do to carry on that effort as well too. Also, we, we participate in the Tri-City Legislative uh, Council as well, too. And that is a uh, group that organizes uh, a trip every year to Olympia to, to uh, uh, talk to our state representatives uh, about some of the key issues that are important to our area. We team up with TriDEC and visit Tri-Cities, the Tri-City Regional Chamber and the Hispanic Chamber the West Richland Chamber as well too. We, we collectively go to, to Olympia every winter and every session and, and speak as one voice and it is really impactful to those representatives um, in Olympia, whether they're from the area or not. And we always usually throw a really good party, but I'd like to acknowledge to the, the effort of uh, Gary Ballou and, and Deb Bone Harris. Uh, it was the Pasco Chambers year to chair that event and that committee and they did a, a stellar job of co-chairing that together and and uh you know a lot of that stuff wouldn't have happened without their without their leadership we also had some other uh, fun events too uh, uh one that we do in conjunction with the asparagus commission and this earlier this year um we had our second annual asparagus fest and we had a 20 percent increase in the attendance there it's a way to really uh, um, highlight uh, um, an, an industry that's still very important to our area and, and really highlight um, agriculture as a whole too in a fun sort of way. We had a very successful auction this past year and in the golf tournament uh, has, has really helped us uh, continue our mission. One other uh, um, item that we don't highlight a whole lot um, but is really important to our area not just in, in agriculture, but any business that may have to export goods overseas to certain countries that may require a certificate of origin. And, and I think just uh, because we have so many walking through the door on a weekly basis that you kind of overlook the importance of that, but uh, a lot of credit goes to, to Marilyn and Rebecca here on the staff of, of kind of going through some of those and seeing where some of the products uh, go to out of Pasco, quite frankly. and and. And we get uh, hundreds of those per year and shows just how strong our area is and dependent on trade as well too. Um, we also, uh, um, so I just wanted to highlight that we also sponsor the Hey King Award. We've been doing that for many years. It's always awarded at the Benton Franklin County Fair and, and um, Reuben Holt won it again for the second year in a row. He kind of had a clean sweep on that. Uh, his name may be, familiar to some of the folks, because I have on there the Mid-Columbia Ag Hall of Fame too, and, and those are the, the uh, uh, recipients this year, but his grandfather, Lyle Holt, is, uh, um, is a recipient of the Ag Advisor a couple years ago. In addition to that, we have uh, scholarships in the name of Lyle Holt as well too, that we give away at the Eastern Washington Ag Expo. <laughs> and, uh, and that highlights some of the, the folks that we've been able to um, um, to help along their way with the education in agriculture. Um, one new aspect that the Ag Hall of Fame did this year is we created a Cultivating Our Future grant. Really what we did is at the event, which is coming up in late January again, um, we asked the industry, those that are in the industry, to, 
donate to this new organization or this new foundation, if you will, to provide education grants uh, throughout uh, the area. And the industry stepped up with really haven't seen what could be of this uh, of this endeavor, but still stepped up with nearly six thousand dollars in cash that we that they entrusted the Ag Hall of Fame committee to. Uh, um, to uh, uh, request for grants and, and, and grant that money out. And it, it, I see that there's a need for it because we had over $20,000 in requests and money. Unfortunately, we couldn't meet, reach those uh, um, goals, but you know, we're, we're looking and working forward and we think we can grow this as well too. And, and the, uh, um, you'll see the, the award winners or awardees of that as well too. Um, and then just not too long ago too, we had a once, kind of near once in a lifetime, maybe a couple times in a lifetime, but we were lucky enough to have a very good view of the solar eclipse uh, based on where we were. We weren't at total eclipse, but we worked closely with the Port of Pasco, had a great idea to really utilize Osprey Point and what we have there and, and to provide viewing for, we figured it'd be a pretty decent crowd when we're talking about this in May and June and um, it really turned out to be a great event. We, we actually ran out of glasses and we probably gave quite a few more vision. I, I guess I'm venturing to guess. I know the port says they thought there was 1,200. I think it might have been even closer to 2,000 people that showed up for that. So that was real fun. It was exciting to do that. And, and, and uh, um, so the Pasco Chamber, with the help of our partners as well too, are, uh, um, are always looking for ideas to help our community become an uh, even better livable community as well too. And, and this wouldn't happen without the support of our executive committee and our board of directors. And uh, if you're on the Pasco Chamber Board of Directors, could you please stand up and let's give them a, a warm thank you with a round of applause. I also want to thank uh, Marilyn, uh, Marilyn Lott, who's new with the Pasco Chamber, and Rebecca Ramsey as well, too. They've been working really hard this summer to make sure that we keep everything on track. So let's give them a round of applause, too, for all the work that they do. All right, well, now I'm going to have uh, Derek Brownson, who is the um, president 2016-17 president of the Pasco Chamber to take us through the rest of the program. Thank you so much and enjoy the rest of your meal. And I think we caught everyone and I'm Derek Brownson with Community First Bank. Again, we'd like to thank Gisa's uh, sponsoring our luncheon this today. And you know, I'm sitting with our guest speaker and he did tell me to say he just knows stuff, but I will actually go through uh, the stuff he does know. Um, in October of 2013, Chris Eiler assumed the position of executive director of the Northwest region for the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. In this capacity, he represents the chamber throughout the states of Alaska, Idaho, Montana, Oregon, Washington, and Wyoming. I guess I didn't realize Wyoming is northwest, but I'll take it. Um, with nearly 15 years of D.C. Hill experience, he has worked on legislative assistant handling health care, education, social security, and telecommunication issues for Sanders Frank Murkowski and Conrad Burns, as well as for Representative Kevin Brady. Chris is responsible for developing and maintaining relationships with lawmakers and their staffs, creating and cultivating relationships with local and state chambers, and activating U.S. Chamber members on key policy issues. He also develops grassroots legislative strategies uh -huh. and intensifies emerging issues in the region to enhance the legislative agendas of and provide services to chamber members. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce, headquartered in Washington, D.C., is the world's largest business federation representing the interests of more than three million businesses of all sizes, sectors, and regions, as well as state and local chambers and industry associations. With that, I'd like to introduce Chris. Thank you, Derek. Uh, as Derek said, my name is Chris Eiler. I am the U.S. Chamber's Executive Director for the Northwest Region. Uh, and as Derek explained, the U.S. Chamber is the world's largest business federation, representing over three million businesses around the world, as well as over 1,500 state and local chambers of commerce. Uh, and it's those partnerships that we have with state and local chambers, like the Pasco Chamber, like the tri city Re Regional Chamber, that are some of our most impor important partnerships. And that's because we simply could not do what we do back in Washington, D.C., representing the business community without the grassroots support we get from local chambers like 
like the Pasco Chamber. So I just want to start uh, by thanking you all for being a member of your local chamber, uh, as well as thanking the Pasco Chamber for your continued support and membership with the U.S. Chamber. So Colin asked me to come here today to give you an explanation of what is going on in Washington, D.C. right now and how the business community is working within the new environment. Uh, but quite frankly, let's be honest, it's really difficult to say that anyone understands what's going on right now. Um, and if you need a reminder of that, you just look at the last two weeks where the president has done an out about face on any number of issues, most notably funding for the government. Um, and right now it remains unclear what direction he intends to go with uh, the DACA program. So this has all led to a great deal of frustration on Capitol Hill, as well as within the business community. Uh, a lot of this confusion and a lot of this frustration has to do with uh, the president's inconsistencies, has a lot to do with a number of the controversies that are continuing to swirl around this administration, has a lot to do with uh, frustration with congressional leadership's inability to, con to corral their members to move a lot of large-scale agenda items. Uh, but it also has a lot to do with the fact that uh, there is there is not there are not many executive branch appointees in place uh, nine months into the new administration. Uh, if you look at the 550 or so key Senate confirmed appointees that need to be put into place uh, prior to the August recess, only 20% of those had been nominated, and even fewer of those had been uh, actually confirmed by the Senate. This is due in large part because Senate Democrats are slow walking a number of these positions, requiring procedural votes, requiring the full 30 hours debate on each nominee, uh, on nominees that typically would be passed by a simple voice vote or just unanimous consent, they are making sure that the process goes as slowly as possible. This has resulted in a lot of positions, uh, even nine months into this administration, being filled by acting assistant and deputy secretaries, interim positions, uh, holdovers from the Obama administration. These people are perfectly capable and competent at doing their jobs, but they, because they are acting or interim, they can't en enact policy. This is further slowing the process down. So for the foreseeable future, you know, the best thing we can say is that you expect a lot of the chaos you're seeing on the news to continue. Um, I wish it was otherwise, but for the foreseeable future, we are going to have to move forward uh, in an environment that's pretty new for a lot of people in Washington, D.C. So where are we right now nine months in? If it's, this were a normal year, Congress would have passed in March or April a fiscal year 2018 budget resolution. They would be well on their way to passing all of the appropriations bills by the end of the fiscal year on September 30th. Uh, likely there would be a few that got carried over to later in the year, but they would have be moving bills to the president's desk. As I said, this is not a normal year. When Congress returned from its August recess, they had yet to pass a fiscal year 2018 budget resolution. No appropriations bill has reached the president's desk. On top of that, they needed to pass uh, emergency funding to help the Gulf Coast recover from Hurricanes Irma and Har Harvey. And by the end of next week, they needed to raise the federal debt ceiling. Fortunately, the urgency of providing disaster relief enabled them to pass uh, the needed disaster relief. Uh, they were able to pass a short-term funding bill, and they were able to pass a temporary increase to the federal debt ceiling. So right now, Congress has given itself some time. They have until December 8th now to come up with a final spending plan for fiscal 2018 and to come up with a plan to raise the debt ceiling in a more longer-term fashion. You know, in the next three months, the U.S. Chamber's priority is going to be first and foremost to make sure Congress does its job and keeps the government open and raises the federal debt ceiling. But secondarily, uh, our, our top priority is going to be to make sure they get going on tax reform. When Congress came into session at the beginning of the year, the business community saw a once-in-a-generation opportunity to pass the first comprehensive tax reform in over 30 years. Both chambers of Congress were controlled by pro-business majorities, and we had in President Trump someone who understood what it means to run a business. Uh, if they do this right, tax reform can be the single most important thing Congress does to, to create robust economic growth. That opportunity still exists, but we need to keep, we need to hold Congress accountable. Uh, are to do, in order to do that, the U.S. Chamber has met, let it be known to all members of Congress and, con and candidates for Congress that we 
We'll use, we will leverage our political program in 2018 and in large part base our political support for candidates for Congress next year on the extent to which members of Congress make sure, do their part to get this process going to enact comprehensive tax reform. And to that end, we have, we have sent to the Hill a set of very straightforward and basic or simple principles that we want Congress to use in coming up with a tax reform package. First and foremost, we want to see lower rates for all businesses, corporations, as well as pass-through entities that file as individuals. We want to see the, the overall code move from the current global system of taxation to a territorial system of taxation. In other words, we don't want to see businesses that have worldwide operations being taxed twice. First, by the wherever they are operating overseas, and then again when they bring that money back to the U.S. We want to see it move to a territorial system, like most of the rest of the economic, or most of the rest of the developed world. We want to see tax reform that is permanent. We want to see a code that is simpler and less costly for businesses to comply with. And we want to see a code that allows the marketplace to decide the winners and losers, uh, not the government. So far, we are encouraged by what we are seeing coming out of the Congress and the administration. Unlike health care, Congress and the administration appear to be working in a coordinated fashion, and they were working off a general set of principles that is consistent with what those principles I just explained to you. Uh, and hopefully, they are telling us that we will see more detailed framework sometime next week, but that could always slip for a week or two. But we, again, we are encouraged that they are, the administration and Congress are working together. You know, the job for the business community and chambers like the Pasco Chamber and the Tri-City Regional Chamber is that you need to hold your member of Congress accountable and make sure they stay focused on getting this done. Related to uh, relieving the tax burden on business, we are also working to relieve the regulatory burden on the business community. Uh, over the past several decades, we have seen an explosion in federal regulations. Since the 1970s, there's been approximately 170,000 new regulations put into the federal Code of Federal Regulations. Uh, too often, you know, our, our members tell us too often these regulations go forward with little concern about the cost and the burden they impose on businesses. Fortunately, this is an area where Congress and the President have actually been making some quiet progress. Uh, starting back in January, Congress, using the expedited proce procedures of what's called the Congressional Review Act, they were able to roll back 14 last-minute last Obama-era regulations. In doing so, it's estimated that they were able to save businesses approximately $4 billion in compliance costs, as well as over 4 million man-hours in, in paperwork. Uh, additionally, the administration has started looking at some of the regulations that the Obama administration put in place over the past four years, uh, most specifically the Waters of the U.S. regulation, where the Obama administration was attempting to expand the waters that they were trying to regulate under the Clean Water Act. Uh, the President issued an executive order directing the EPA to uh, begin the process of rolling back this rule, uh, and that, that process is right now ongoing. We also saw uh, earlier this summer, or last month, a federal court in Texas uh, moved to permanently block the Department of Labor's uh, overtime rule that they, the Department of Labor put out last summer. This is where they were raising the threshold under which businesses would be required to pay their employees overtime. They were raising it from a threshold of $23,660 per year to over $47,476 per year. That's a more than 100% increase. Uh, the U.S. Chamber does not disagree that that threshold needs to be raised, but we think a 100, more than 100% increase is excessive. So we are happy that the, the court blocked that rule, and we are now working with the administration to come up with a more reasonable uh, uh, threshold uh, to raise that to. In addition to regulatory relief, we're also being we're also fo focus, focus, excuse me, focused on regulatory reform, meaning the process by which rules and regulations are promulgated. Uh, since the enactment of the Administ Administrative Procedures Act uh, over 70 years ago, there has been no major reform to how rules and regulations are enacted. Uh, the, the U.S. Chamber has been working for the past several Congresses on what's called the Regulatory Accountability Act. 
This would, for these, the most expensive regulations, those are regulations with an economic impact of over $100 million or more, would require more public uh, involvement from the outset. It would require on-the-record hearings for those impacted by rules and regulations. It would require more, the use of cost-benefit analyses uh, throughout the process of developing regulations to make sure that the most cost-effective regulation that achieves congressional intent is what is ultimately selected. And it would require the agencies to go back every so often and look at the regulations that are on the book to determine whether the regulations are achieving what they were set out, they set out to do when they were enacted, uh, and determining whether those regulations are even needed to remain on the books. Uh, fortunately, this, this legislation has already passed the U.S. House of Representatives. It's been reported out of the Senate Homeland Security and Government uh, Reform Committee with bipartisan support, and we're hopeful that this will get done sometime this year. Now, meanwhile, while Congress is working on tax reform and regulatory reform, uh, the administration is going to be engaging in a series of negotiations with, with our North American trading partners. Um, we entered this year with a lot of apprehensions about the trade agenda. Uh, last year's uh, election saw a lot of negative comments made about trade on both sides of the aisle. Uh, so we were quite concerned when the president came into office and immediately pulled the U.S. out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership and continued a lot, saying a lot of negative things about the North American Free Trade Agreement. Fortunately, he seems to have changed his tune a bit and appears more open to simply renegotiating or modernizing the North American Free Trade Agreement. We welcome this. The U.S. Chamber has been very supportive of trade agreements uh, for the past uh, decade or so. We see trade agreements as the single best way to open markets and overcome trade barriers to American goods and services that are being exported. Uh, so as these negotiations proceed, uh, there's already been two rounds of negotiations. There's going to be another five or so uh, rounds that we expect. You know, our priority is going to be to work with the administration to make sure that none of the gains we have seen over the past 24 years of the North American Free Trade Agreement are undermined. There's over 14 million American jobs that are reliant on trade with Canada and Mexico. Uh, each day, there's over $3.5 billion in commerce going across our borders with both countries. That's $1.3 trillion a year. Here in Washington State, this, is the sing this state is the single most trade-reliant state in the nation. There's close to a million jobs in this state that are reliant on trade. Over 330,000 of those jobs are tied to trade with Canada and Mexico alone. There's over 12,600 businesses in this state. 90% of those are small and medium-sized businesses, and you're, these these companies are exporting over one or $107 billion a year. So this is a big deal for this state. It's a big deal for this country. You know, we will continue to push forward to make sure that uh, these trade agreements uh, work best for American employers and open markets to our goods and services. Finally, I want to circle back to health care. Uh, the U.S. Chamber was very disappointed in how the health care debate played out over the summer. Uh, we recognized that the bills that were being debated weren't perfect, but they did address a lot of the concerns that the business community has with the Affordable Care Act, namely the taxes that are imposed on businesses. Uh, each of the bills, the bill passed by the House, as well as all the bills that were considered in the Senate, rolled back or delayed the so-called Cadillac tax, the medical device tax, and the health insurance tax, as well as lifted a lot of the restrictions on employers' ability to offer flexible spending accounts and health savings accounts. At this point, it doesn't look like Congress will be able to come back and do any kind of large or uh, large scale uh, repeal and replace of the Affordable Care Act. So our work moving forward uh, given this reality is to work with the administration to find ways to alleviate some of the burden placed on the business community by the Affordable Care Act. Our top priority here is making sure that the health, the so-called health insurance tax does not go, to, go into effect on January 1st. This is a sales tax on health insurance plans uh, offered in the fully insured market. This is where approximately 86% of all small businesses are able to offer their employees health insurance. If this tax goes into effect on January 1st, uh, individuals in the, who buy their, their insurance uh, can, see their, can expect to see their uh, premiums increase by approximately $158. Families could see their in premiums increase by as much as $560. Uh, and this doesn't just impact 
these plans in the, 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 the private insurance market, but it also impacts uh, people who buy Medicare, seniors who buy Medicare Advantage plans. Uh, if this tax goes into place, those seniors can expect to see their Medicare Advantage premiums go up by as much as $243. Uh, so this is, this is a big hit, and it's something that the U.S. Chamber is going to prioritize getting done this year. Uh, it was supposed to go into effect several years ago. Um, however, the U.S. Chamber, working uh, with bipartisan majorities in both chambers of Congress, as well as with President Obama, were able to delay this for two years. It's, that delay is now going to expire in January if nothing's done. So I encourage you to reach out to your congressional delegation to urge them to uh, work with the business community to block this, this tax from going into place. So with that, you know, I, I don't want to go too long. Um, as I said at the outset, you can expect that a lot of the chaos, a lot of the uncertainty to continue moving forward. Um, there's this, you know, there are a lot of questions about the direction that President Trump is going to go. Uh, there continue to be a lot of questions about how much longer the congressional Republicans will be able to work with President Trump, how much longer the more conservative elements of the Republican Party will be able to work with President Trump as well as with their own leadership. And it remains to be seen whether Congress is going to be able to do anything in a, in a bipartisan fashion. As far as the business community is concerned, we continue to be pleased that Congress is moving forward, prioritizing most of our agenda items, tax reform, regulatory reform, um, and addressing some of these other issues that I raised. So with that, I want to thank you for allowing me to speak to you. Um, and I also want to thank you again for your continued support for our work back in D.C. As I said, we simply cannot do what we do without the support we get from our local chamber partners. So, so thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions uh, if anyone has any. All right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I'll be around for a little while afterwards if anyone wants to grab me to uh, ask any questions. So thank you. Well, you were correct. You do know a lot of stuff. Thank you, Chris. And let's give Chris one more round of applause. OK, at this point in time, we're going to acknowledge a couple outgoing board members. Uh, the first one is Lance Hobson. And I don't think Lance made it, because I don't see any hairy legs out there. Um, so Lance is the past president, 2015-16. He's served on the chamber board since 2011. Lance has been extremely engaged by volunteering on numerous events, offering a home for the float, which I don't think we have a float anymore, do we? It's still pending. Oh, we might have a float, as well as providing stellar leadership for the chamber. Uh, Lance was not able to make it today, so let's just uh, give him a round of applause and we'll tell him about it. Uh, the second person is uh, Holly Seiler of Second Harvest. Holly has served on the Chamber Board since 2015, brings to the Board great insight and involvement on Pasco Chamber projects and communications. I don't believe Holly is able to make it either, so we'll just have to tell her we clap, clap for her as well. Holly Sala. <laughs> so at this point in time, I'm supposed to do my outgoing presence address, and well, I was on a New York City subway 36 hours ago, and I think they took it from me, so I don't have much of one, uh, short of uh, I do want to um, Welcome Dennis, who will be doing next month's luncheon, Dennis Giese, in the back. Um, he will be our new incoming uh, Pasco Chamber Board President. And um, I'm sure he's going to do a great job because it's got to come up from Lance in shorts, me in polos, to Dennis wearing a suit. <laughs> uh, at this point in time, let's, uh, we have uh, three new board members coming upon. So let's, I'm going to invite up uh, Sarah McPherson from Har Second Harvest. Uh, Delt Clark from Christensen Companies, and Samantha Horton from Durashine Clean. I never got one of those. <laughs> Are those new? Right. We're good. Okay, so uh, this is the charge to the board members and officers. 
The responsibility you're accepting is exciting. You're called to be leaders of this chamber promoting the Pasco Chamber as the front door for tens of thousands of individuals and businesses for over 100 years, representing business to agriculture, to education, and the community. You'll be called on to make sacrifices of your time, creative energy, resources, and most importantly, money. The requirements for serving this group may come at inconvenient times, and sometimes it does. Uh, you may be called upon to stretch all of your present problem solving and conflict resolution skills, sometimes, and do not assume your present commitment lightly to do a good job or require that that is in you. Will you, as newly elected officers and directors, realizing the responsibilities of leadership that have been placed upon you, agree to give your time and energy to faithfully serve the Greater, Pas Greater Pasco Area Chamber of Commerce in accordance with bylaws? If so, please answer, I will. Thank you. Uh, let's see here. So now we got the uh, installation, the actual um, word association part. I, state your name. Recognizing the important responsibility I'm undertaking. Wow. <laughs> In serving as a member of the Board of Directors of the Pasco Chamber of Commerce. Hereby pledge to carry out in a trustworthy and diligent manner. <laughs> All the duties and obligations inherent, inherent in my role as a board member. I'm one. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is charges to the membership, so for all of you, not the last three poor folks that are up here. I've just given a view of what it takes to lead this organization. Now to you, the membership, who have chosen these individuals as your leaders, you have given them an important job, an impossible job without your help and support. That means you stand united and support the decisions of the board. You probably will not agree with them all, you register all differing opinions with the appropriate person with this rule. A complaint may not come to the board without a recommended solution and your personal willingness to be part of the answer. Express your appreciation to your leaders often. They are serving a great sacrifice for your benefit. It is up to you to be positively involved. Assume responsibility for helping your fellow members. With the foregoing understanding, do you pledge your support to these, your chosen leaders? Please indicate your support by saying, we do. Great. Thank you and congratulations. Let's give our new board members a round of applause. Okay, now on to the awards portion. Uh, we're still good, right? Okay. Uh, the Pasco Chamber Awards. The first award is the Momentum Award. And this award is given out to Tara Wiswall of Baker Boyer Bank. Uh, Tara spearheaded our most successful Eastern Washington Ag Expo with rebranding and program and has been intimately involved in the betterment of this show, has dedicated her time and involvement on the board of directors constantly striving to make the Pasco Chamber better. Just because I didn't want Mitch Roach left out, uh, Mitch, will you come up and accept for Tara? <laughs> Yeah, take a picture. Take a picture of both items. <laughs> That's good. Oh, All right, for Tara. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and this year's business of the year, Lamb Weston. Lamb Weston is a longtime leading employer in the Pasco community. Important economic driver for our local economy, recently became its own entity by separating from ConAgra. They are community driven, and at this point in time, like to announce they have agreed to be the primary sponsor of the Eastern Washington Ag Expo. <laughs> Thank you, Dave Cooper. Oh, we're getting close. Uh, I'd like to again thank Gisa Credit Union for sponsoring our today's luncheon. Did you see their little 
ways too. I was confused. I didn't know what they were. <laughs> I knew he wouldn't know what they were. So on your tables, Gisa has uh, provided everybody a gift. It's a little pillow, a, a iPhone or I'm sorry, smart phone uh, a pillow so that you can uh, have it in an angle on your desk or on your bed. Oh, and it cleans the screen too. So yes, yeah, thank you so much to Gisa for for being today's sponsor. They've been a uh, um, active and great community member throughout the whole Tri-Cities and, and they sponsor a lot of our events uh, at, uh, at the Pasco Chamber of Commerce too. And as a matter of fact, they're gonna help us with our December luncheon, which is our nonprofit luncheon too. So um, we're really excited to have uh, Gisa as our sponsor and, and, and actually the official credit union of the Pasco Chamber too. That's what we use. So thank you so much with that. So Derek, I guess it's back to you. Thank you, Gisa. Door price. Oh, I, I, I was ready. I kind of forgot the words. Did you come up with your speech yet? No, I left it on the subway. <laughs> so, so the, the first one is uh, it's a paper and supply. It's uh, either a case of TP or towels. paper towels. Uh, so we have two door prizes today. The first one is going to be from Columbia Basin Paper and Supply, and it's going to be a case of paper towels and or. And or or toilet paper. <laughs> it's not Mitch Roach, is it? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Roach, would you like to come back up again for your toilet paper? <laughs> it's not actually here, but you will have a gift certificate. Oh, there's a couple? Okay. Yeah, so Just a couple. I have go ahead and grab up? the mic. Oh. So the first one is, I guess we can do the wine first. So it's a bottle of wine, Marisol, is it? Do you know what wine it is? Good wine. It's good wine, it's very good wine. Right. Oh, and that is, um, so from the Port of Pasco, Myra Reina. Right. Okay. There we go. Oh, yeah. I'll be down there. <laughs> And then the next door prize is a really cool gift basket. We've got, oh gosh, there's beer, some Gisa swag, some more of those wonderful cell phone holders. And um, it's 10 vouchers to the Americans game. So the cool thing about those, you can pick any game you want, any seat you want, and you don't have to use them all at once. You can use them throughout the season, so they're good for any regular game. And the winner for that from Tridec, Carl Adrian. Oh, right. Carl. <laughs> With that, I'd like to call the luncheon to a close and hope you have a great Monday. Thank you for coming.